Well, uh, this morning, uh, we're continuing our current series uh, focusing on Jesus' sermon found in, Matthew's, uh, in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. It's known as the Sermon on the Mount. And throughout these chapters, we've seen over and over again that Jesus repeatedly and radically challenges our conventional lines of thinking. Um, he paints a picture of what living as his followers looks like uh, on a daily basis, and his words, friends, they're hard-hitting. Uh, the call to follow Jesus pulls in the opposite direction from the way that we naturally default. Have you noticed that? The call uh, to follow Jesus, the call of discipleship, is a call off of the path of least resistance. It's a call to swim upstream and, and to go against the flow. Uh, with, that uh, with that said, it's my prayer that as we study Jesus' teaching, that each and every one of us would find ourselves equipped, and equipped uh, to pursue our best year yet with Jesus, uh, a year of becoming more and more like our Savior, a year of growth. And with that in mind, this morning we're going to be turning uh, to Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. I'd invite you to turn there in your Bible. It's a great idea so you can follow along. The words will also be on the screen, but it's a great idea to follow along. And Jesus' teaching here addresses uh, some things that uh, might be a little uncomfortable for us in some ways. It addresses the topic of being anxious or worrying. That could be translated both ways. Uh, the English Standard Version puts a, a heading over this passage, Do Not Be Anxious. And the New International Version puts the heading, Do Not Worry. Now, uh, before we go a whole lot farther, just think with me. Uh, I, I've got a question for all of us. What are some of the top things that you find yourself worrying or anxious about? Now, I don't know what makes the top of the list for you, but I could give you some uh, things that I know are, are common answers to the question. We worry about our health and the health of those of our closest friends and family. We worry about money and consistently ask ourselves the question, will there be enough? We worry about our employment and wonder, will I have a job next week, next month, next year? We find ourselves anxious about our personal safety. It, it might be, or the personal safety of our family and friends. It might be that when you're traveling on the roads in the winter and they're slippery and you find yourself anxious about personal safety. Or, candidly, in our society, we've had a lot of discussion about that this last year with the pandemic. A common worry is sur surrounds uh, our personal safety. And in addition to all of that, honestly, there's a lot of anxiety today. There's a lot of anxiety in a lot of circles. Maybe you would identify, maybe you wouldn't, but surrounding our country. The last year's been difficult. If you haven't noticed that, uh, where you been? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, we've had, uh, there's been COVID. There's been COVID restrictions. There's been disagreements about COVID restrictions, even among followers of Christ. Does that surprise you? No, not at all. It shouldn't. But it, it's been stressful. It, you know, it, it's been a difficult year. Things have been different. Not everything's been the same as it's been before. There's been unrest. There's been riots. There's been violence. And friends, we're polarized as a nation. And I, I find uh, many, uh, I, I've heard it asked so many times, uh, people asking the question, what's next? And it's tempting to give in to counterproductive and even polarizing worry. And yes, when I say that, I do understand that there is a big difference between self-centered and counterproductive anxiety in godly concern and seeking to walk in wisdom. I do understand that. That said, our passage this morning, in, in our passage this morning, the word that the New International Version translates worry and the English Standard Version translates be uh, anxious appears fully six times in the span of ten verses. So that should give us an idea what the theme of the passage is. And everything that Jesus teaches is wrapped around the truth that living as disciples of the Lord Jesus and being consumed with worry don't go together. 
And so even as we look at, okay, there's the temptation to be anxious about all those kinds of things, anxious about our country, whatever it is, uh, all those kinds of things, differing opinions about uh, all the challenges we face, the political challenges, et cetera, et cetera. It's so easy to, to give in to worry. But here we see living as disciples of the Lord Jesus and being consumed with worry don't go together. And maybe the things that you worry about are not the things I listed at all. I mean, I know those make the top of the list for many people, but it could be something entirely different. The statement is still the same. Living as a disciple of Jesus and being consumed with worry, it doesn't, they don't go together. So let's jump into the passage. Jesus begins showing the futility of being anxious or of worrying in uh, verses 25 to 30. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus calls his followers to see the futility of worry. And the passage begins with Jesus saying, Do not be anxious about your life. Look at verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What you will eat, or what you will drink, or your body, what you will put on, is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing. Did you catch the rhetorical question? The question itself makes the point. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? And the obvious answer is yes, of course, there is more to life than food and clothes. There is more to life than our daily material needs. And from this point, Jesus continues showing the futility of, wor uh, of worry, the futility of being consumed with it. Uh, being consumed with worry simply doesn't make sense. In verse 27, makes this point with yet another penetrating rhetorical question. Think about it. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? I mean, I, I think maybe we just need to pause and ponder that. Another way to translate, who of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span, to, uh, to the days of your life? The obvious answer, again, it just kind of makes the point, right? It's a rhetorical question. It's a question that it makes the point, is no one. And we need to consider and ponder this truth. And Jesus goes on to make the point of the futili about the futility of worry by turning to a couple of examples, a, a pair of examples. Uh, verse 26 uh, turns to the example of the birds. And then in verses 28 and 30 to 30, he turns to the example of the flowers and grasses of the field. The flowers that grow out, uh, out there, in, you know, wildflowers growing out in the field. And uh, let's take an example, take a closer look at the first example, that of the birds. This is verse 26. Look at the birds of the air. So just imagine in your mind the birds flying through the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Think about it. Birds don't fall into the trap of storing up treasures for themselves. And, of course, that's the trap that Jesus has just addressed in the previous section. Matthew 6, 19 says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. And this is connected to our passage because you might have noticed that the first word in our passage is therefore. And so therefore is a word that looks back at what comes previously. And it's a good idea, a Bible study tip, a little aside. If you come to therefore in your Bible reading, look back and ask, what's the therefore? Therefore, therefore, by, nece by necessity, points back to what comes before. And, and here what we see is that in all honesty, often our anxious feelings are the force or the driving force, the motivation, if you will, behind storing up for ourselves, uh, uh, storing up treasure for ourselves, right? And you say, how is that? Why is that... Uh, uh, a driving force be behind storing up treasure for ourselves. Well, worry can drive futile attempts 
to protect ourselves from every possible disaster. And here's the problem. No amount of treasure will ever be sufficient to provide protection from every possible and conceivable situation. It just can't be done. We will never be able to store up enough treasure to adequately protect against every contingency. We just have to know that's true. I, it's an uncomfortable truth because we'd like to think that we could be ready for everything, any, anything and everything, but the reality is we can't. And uh, Jesus is just confronting us with that. Birds, on the other hand, don't fall into that trap. They are busy. Have you noticed that? The birds are not lazy. They're busy. They're, they're working. Uh, but at the same time, they depend on God to provide for their needs. Birds neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet God provides for them. Now, it would badly miss Jesus' point to think that work is unimportant. That's not what he's saying. Bird, birds work while they simultaneously depend on God for their every meal. The Bible is clear that we must never use trusting God as an excuse for laziness, or, or I love the old word, it's a one I really enjoy, slothfulness. Who likes that one? Slothfulness. We must never use trusting God as an excuse for sloth, for laziness. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, speaks about the sin of idleness as it had set in in the church in the city of Thessalonica. And he says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 10. For even when we were with you, we, uh, we would give you this command, if anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. And again, he was addressing a reality in that church is that some people were idle. They weren't doing anything. They weren't working. We need to work and we need to trust God to provide for our needs. They go hand in hand. God's provision and our work go together. They're, they go hand in hand. God is our provider. And if we ever begin to think that we're self-sufficient, it would not take much uh, to change our minds. All it takes is a couple of bad things to happen. And all of a sudden, we can't even pretend to believe that we're in control. You know what I'm talking about? Say, I, I got this. It only takes a couple of things to happen. I don't got this. In, in contemporary vernacular. It, it doesn't take much. Uh, things are fragile. We can have everything, we can have the appearance, the veneer of having everything together, having, you know, our, a good, good plan, everything set up, uh, and then just a couple of bad things happen, and pretty soon we just see that we, we are not in control, and we are dependent on God as our provider. Well, with that, ex with this example of the birds in mind, it, it concludes with a rhetorical question. And it says this, Jesus says, are you not of more value than they? Speaking about the birds. And the obvious answer is yes. People are created in the image of God, and animals are not. In Genesis 1, God created everything out of nothing. And if you read through the account of the, the days of creation, the six days of creation, on the seventh he rested, in one, chapter 1, verse 26 of the book of Genesis, we come to this. God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. The logic here is a compelling argument from lesser to greater. If God takes care of the birds, and he does, then how much more will he care for us, for people, that's men and women, who bear his image? This is a call for us to trust him to provide for our daily needs. Remember the phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread, trusting God to provide for our needs. And then we come again to that rhetorical question. I already mentioned it, verse 27. It really gets to the point. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of his life? Now, you might notice, depending on what translation you have sitting in your lap, it gets translated different ways. I want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, the New King James translates, which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Uh, the NIV translates, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Isn't that kind of a little bit more paraphrased, but gets the sense. Can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour? No. What's happening here? The short answer is that there's a figure of speech. And the idea of adding one cubit, which is a measure of length, think of a yardstick, if you will, you know, a measure of length, 
The idea of adding one cubit to one's stature, our height, is a figure of speech uh, that points to and is talking about the length of our lives. So all those translations are getting at the sense of it, uh, some a little bit more literally and some translating the figure of speech. But the idea is that worrying or being anxious will not ever add hours to our lives. It, it won't make us taller either, but it will, not add, it will not add hours to our lives. The rhetorical question, verse 27, drives home the futility of being anxious. In Psalm 139, we are told, Psalm 139, verse 16 specifically, it's not on the screen, but um, you can look it up on your own time, but it says that all our days are written in God's book before yet one of them came to be. Every day of our life is written in God's book before one of them comes to be. Can you just ponder that? We can't, it, it, the, the psalmist actually says such knowledge is too wonderful for me, which is, which is right, it is. It's too, it's too wonderful for us, but it's true. Every one of our days is written in God's book in his providential and sovereign hands before one of them comes to be. Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Well, no one. We can't. It's impossible. Now let's turn to that second example, that of the flowers uh, in the field. And this shows the futility of worry as well. And Jesus begins asking in verse 28, And why do you worry about clothes? You can probably expand that to other, you know, physical needs by application, but, uh, you know, shelter, that kind of a thing. But clothing, why do you worry about clothing? And Jesus' uh, Jesus' example looks uh, to the lilies or, or the flowers of the field, uh, and the flowers don't do anything, but God, uh, according to his providential care, clothes them better than the greatest of Israel's kings, King Solomon. And friends, who here knows how beautiful a mountain meadow full of wildflowers in full bloom can be. It is utterly breathtaking, isn't it? We've all seen pictures. Some of us have been in those meadows. I, I know I have. And creation declares the glory of God. And Jesus says that the flower's clothing surpasses the clothing of the richest of all of Israel's kings, a guy named Solomon. And you say, how great was Solomon? We have to go back to 1 Kings and, and read about it. But first King, in 1 first Kings 10, verse 23, we get a little bit glimpse of his splendor. This is just a taste, but this is what it says. Thus, King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. He was the greatest. The splendor of his kingdom. And with that, Jesus makes his point with another rhetorical question in verse 30. And again, the argument is from lesser to greater. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? And, and we understand the question, uh, the, the question's reference to the fire a little bit better when we understand that grass and flowers of the fields were used as fuel to fire ovens in the ancient is, uh, world, in ancient, Israel, in ancient Israel. So that's how they got fuel to bake their own, bake the bread. Obviously, if God knows how to care for the flowers and for the grass, he knows how to ca take care of us. Now, I understand that much of this isn't all that hard to understand. I, I think probably most of us would agree with that. It, it isn't that hard to understand. It's just hard to live out. I get that. So the next time we find ourselves being, uh, giving way to anxiety... We, when we find ourselves being weighed down with worry, let's commit to keep Jesus' teaching about the futility of worry in uh, the forefront of our minds, uh, to meditate and reflect on it. When we find ourselves worrying about our health, or money, or work, safety, or our country, or the world our kids are growing up in, or whatever it is, we need to remember worry is futile, and more importantly, that, if God, that God takes care of the birds, and we are much more valuable than they. We need to remember that God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is burned. And we need to ask ourselves the question of verse 27. Friends, I can tell you I have asked myself this question, and it is effective. It's, it's, it's meditating on God's word. It's reflecting in a prolonged way and pondering God's word. I've asked myself this question many a time. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life or, or her life? It's, it's a great tool. 
It's one we need to ponder. It's one we need to have in our toolbox to reflect on. Friends, thinking about it, giving way to consuming and counterproductive worry indicates a problem in our view of God. I want you to think about this a little bit. This might be a little bit of a stretch uh, to think about, but it's clear. Giving way to worry, consuming counterproductive anxiety, worry, indicates a problem in our view of God. You say, why do I say that? Ask yourself, do I believe that he is in absolute control and that he controls the future and that he is all-powerful? Or another way to get at it, in in a sense, worry doubts God's wisdom. So what do I what do I what do I mean by that? It, in a sense, leads into questioning if He knows what He is doing. You see what I mean? Or maybe not that, but it uh, it could question worry can also question, uh, call into question and doubt God's love. You say how so? It's by doubting His loving provision for His children. Well, okay, how do I think about that? Or here again, maybe another one. It doubts God's power to meet our needs. Anybody remember, maybe maybe you heard about it in Bible instruction, maybe it's been a while, but there's some big omni words that talk about who God is, the, 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 the attributes of God. Uh, he is omniscient. He is all-knowing. He is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. That means everywhere present. And, and add to that the, uh, the attribute of eternality. These are God's incommunicable attributes. That means they belong to God. There are His communicable attributes that they belong to Him, but we can uh, be that way too in an ever-increasing way, like holiness. God is holy. We can grow in holiness. We, can, we are never going to be omniscient. It's an incommunicable attribute. It belongs to God and God alone. We will never be eternal either because we can have eternal life, but we will never, but we had a point in time when we began. You see what I'm saying? God is without beginning or end. So think about his incommunicable attributes, the things that may, the, 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 who God is. He's omniscient. He's eternal. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere present, all-knowing, omniscient, all-powerful. Think about that. Say, well, worry doesn't fit with those things very well, does it? Because when we gaze on the truth of who God is, how could we? Well, I don't. It's hard to worry. It, it motivates trust as we gaze on God. So uh, I, I say this because uh, the aspect of telling people not to worry. It sometimes turns into a little bit of scolding, and I, I've heard sermons that sound that way sometimes, and I don't want to be that way. You know, it's just like, stop worrying, it's a bad idea, okay? You know, that, that's, well, and, and, and everybody walks out and says, thanks, I don't know how to do that. I hear somebody, well, you know exactly what I'm getting at. And you feel scolded and beat up and, you know, okay, discouraged, and I, well, I, 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 but I have this problem, I get anxious. What's the anecdote? If you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, if you're a child of God, gaze on who God is, and worry will melt. It's like putting a snowman in front of a campfire. <laughs> you know, it, it, our worries will melt as we gaze on the glory of who God is. And I think we can see how be, giving way to worry can question God. Do you know what's coming? God, are you powerful to care for me? Do you are do you know what you're doing? Of course he does. And we need to preach that to ourselves. I mean, it, it's not anything, revo it's not revolutionary, like as in the fact we don't know this, but it's what we need to remind ourselves of these things. Now, don't take this out of context. Th this doesn't mean that we need to put a fake and happy face on uh, very difficult and horrible circumstances. Uh, the Bible calls for lament when we face such hardship. But even in lament, we are saying that we lament the the. the the, the difficulty and the pain and, and the sorrow, but we trust God. We trust God in the midst of lamenting. Now, Jesus continues to teach, showing that worry is inconsistent with trusting God in verses 31 
uh, to 34, the end of the chapter. I'll read that now. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. You might need to, I might need an amen here. Uh, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Does anyone want to say amen? Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. I think we can all identify with that. All right. Anxiety pushes away deep trust in the Lord, and trusting in God drives out fear, worry, and anxiety. They're opposing forces. Anxiety pushes away deep trust in the Lord, while trusting in the Lord pushes away worry, anxiety, fear, those kinds of things. In these verses, Jesus teaches that worry is incompatible, inconsistent with trusting God by contrasting the thinking of the pagans with the thinking of his followers. Think about it, verses 31 and 32. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles, the NIV translates pagans, non-believers, uh, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Put simply, people who don't know the Lord, who haven't come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ, those who don't know the Lord, will be consumed with worry, asking, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? These are normal questions asked by the non-believing world, and Jesus says that the Gentile pagans run after these things. That's wh what they chase. They characterize the thinking of someone who does not know Jesus. This is what you, you pursue. And I believe that we could well apply this, a little, uh, the principle of this, uh, to a few more questions today. Where shall I work? Where shall I live? What shall I drive? And more. And the list goes on. And in contrast to the pagan lifestyle of chasing material possessions and worry, followers of Jesus are to be different. And verse 33 marks this beginning with these words, we sang them so well, but seek first the kingdom of God. This is, marked, this is a marked contrast with the pagan lifestyle that was just described. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Verse 33, we sang it. This is the heart and climax of Jesus' teaching in this passage. And the reference to these things looks back on the questions, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Our, our daily physical needs. Now I'd like to read this verse, verse 33, from several different translations to allow the different way of saying the same thing to help the truth sink in. From the older King James Version, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Again, the song we just sang earlier, Seek Ye First. Or the more contemporary New Living Translation. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Or the simpler language of the New International Reader's Version. But put God's kingdom first. Do what he wants you to do. Then all these things will be given to you. So let's ponder that question. What does it mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Well, think about it. Think with me here. The values of the kingdom are laid out for us here in the Sermon on the Mount, right? Seeking first the kingdom of God is putting God first in following his commands and allowing Jesus' teaching to turn our thinking inside out and upside down. And that's what the Sermon on the Mount has been doing. Allowing God's word to lead us in countercultural paths, off the path of least resistance, into thinking differently and living differently. Candidly, it means, in the language of the Sermon on the Mount, loving our enemies, praying for our persecutors, turning the other cheek. It means our supreme loyalty is to the Lord and that our allegiance to the kingdom of heaven comes before anything else. Can I say that again? Seeking first the kingdom of God means our allegiance to the kingdom of heaven comes before any other allegiance. In a time of political heat, it means our citizenship in heaven is supreme over all earthly temporary citizenships. 
being a follower of Jesus first. Before any other allegiance. Don't misunderstand this. I love America. But I'm a Christian first. That's what we need to seek first the kingdom of God. Our allegiance to Jesus before anything else. When it comes to how we use our time, let's think about this. When it comes to how we use our time, uh, there's the well-known excuse, I just don't have time. Who's heard that before? None of us have heard that. None of us have said that either, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Uh, I have. I just don't have time. And then sometimes maybe that applies to to consistent church attendance, Bible reading, prayer, serving and uh, the Lord in different ways. I I don't know, whatever that might be. But there's that the excuse, I just don't have time. Now, I realize that there's a set hours of that we can't have time for everything. I I totally understand that. There is a set number of hours in every week. So we everybody has to say no to things. That's absolutely true. But seeking first the kingdom necessarily means seeking to put the important pieces into our schedule first. Uh, giving God the leftovers of our time is not seeking first his kingdom. Some of us might be saying, ouch. Well, uh, you know, I get it. I, we probably all are, if we're honest. Or how about when it comes to our money and material possessions? We should ask ourselves the question, what would people think about our priorities if they looked at our bank statements or our credit card statements? You should also ask the question, if they looked at my calendar, what would they think? They had no idea who I was, but they, they came and stumbled across... These documents, my calendar, my bank statement, my credit card statement, what would they think my priorities are? Are we intentionally, consistently, and sacrificially giving to the Lord's work, both financially and maybe more sacrificially of our time, or are we giving God the leftovers, which is a common temptation? Can we see the difference between seeking first the kingdom of God and going, well, I got a little bit of leftovers, so here, you know, here's a leftovers mentality. You see the difference? When it comes to spiritual disciplines, we need to be honest with ourselves. Do I make time for Bible reading, prayer, and for fellowship? The passage reminds us we need to evaluate our priorities and we need to pursue what's important. Is our supreme aim in life to glorify God? Our supreme loyalty to King Jesus above all else. My supreme aim to bring glory to my Creator. A healthy and growing relationship with the Lord ought to be our top priority. Pursuing our best year yet with Jesus ought to be our top priority. Now that assumes, of course, that we've gotten to the starting line and begun a personal relationship with Jesus. If you haven't, ask somebody today, ask me how you can get to the starting line. You don't run a race until you start the race and you come to the starting line. So if you have not come to the place of surrendering to the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, I'm a sinner, save me. Talk to someone this morning before you leave so that you know, so you can get to the starting line. But for those of us who are in the race, who have gotten to the starting line, our aim ought to always be pursuing our best year yet with Jesus, a year of growing closer to our Savior. On the other hand, a life consumed by worry demonstrates a lack of trust in God, and it also means that our focus is going to be off the mark. Worry turns us from trusting God, and it occupies our minds and distracts us. Giving way to anxiety doubts God's goodness and betrays a lack of confidence in his knowledge and care. We've talked about that already a little bit. And I've heard worry described as functional atheism. You might say, wow, I'll say that again. Worry has been described as functional atheism. That's a jarring statement, but it makes a very important point. I mean, I'm not, it's a jarring statement, and it's meant to jar us. But think about it, in, in some cases, succumbing to worry means I, I don't know, I don't believe in God because I don't believe that he can provide for me. I don't believe that he cares for me. And so it's like living like it's believing in God, but living like I don't. That's why the, the Bible commentator calls it functional atheism. Is it's believing in the Lord, but living as if I didn't. Our belief in the Lord has to change things. Being consumed with worry is inconsistent with trusting God And with that, the passage ends with a self-evident statement. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Isn't that good? Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 
And I'm sure, friends, that many of us are sitting here nodding our heads in agreement with all of this, but you're struggling with the question, how do I do this? Some of us are probably thinking, I agree with everything, with all of this. I see what Jesus says. I see that what he teaches is true, but how do I live this out? You're thinking, avoiding giving way to anxiety is easy to talk about and much harder to actually live out, to which I say, amen, I heartily agree. You might be saying to yourself, avoiding worry is close to impossible. After all, we naturally worry. It's normal. We come by it naturally. To that I agree with, too. It's the path of least resistance. But remember, Jesus calls us off the path of least resistance. And the way to experience freedom from worry is to give everything to God in prayer. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So friends, instead of just saying, don't be anxious, don't worry, what do we do? We pray about everything all the time. We pray with thanksgiving. We gaze on who God is. And our worries melt. We turn our concerns that can easily turn into worry, godly concerns, and we cast it to the Lord in prayer, knowing that he cares for us. And knowing that he knows the situation completely and we don't. Knowing that he is infinitely and perfectly wise. And that he knows what he's doing. So the anecdote to worry is gazing on who God is. It's prayer with thanksgiving. And as we do those things, we can experience freedom from worry by bringing everything to the Lord in prayer. With that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, through the power of your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would help us, help me, help my brothers and sisters to live this out. And Lord, I pray that our living differently, that our turning off the path of least resistance, and rather than being succumbing uh, to, to fear and to worry, but rather trusting you in the midst of storms, that that would be a wonderful opportunity for us to share the hope that we have within us, and that many, as a result, would come to know you, Lord Jesus, as Savior. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.